In the spring of 2018, this church body selected seven individuals from within the church body and formed a vision committee. The, the committee consists of Beverly Shadle, Jennifer Perkins, Tia Paget, Frank Westmoreland, Terry Perkins, Dr. Dustin Walter, and myself. And in this committee, which was an hour, I guess a year and a half long process, we asked this question. What is it that we've done in the past as a church, and what do we want to do in the future in, a ch in the church? In other words, what are we doing here? And how can we tell it to individuals in a clear, succinct way? And after a few months, we crafted the vision statement or mission statement for the church that you've seen for several months now when you walk into the foyer. And the statement is that we seek to honor and glorify God through worship, discipleship, and service. This is stuff that we've already been doing and this is stuff that we want to continue to do in the future of the church. But we didn't want to just craft a mission statement and say, here it is, here we go, let's do it. We wanted to give the church more guidance as to what to do. And so from there, we developed 12 objectives to accomplish the mission statement. You'll be seeing this mission statement more and more in places. We're going to get it over in the other building, more in the bulletin, etc. But what do we do? How is it that we accomplish our mission to honor and glorify God through worship, discipleship, and service? We have 12 objectives that for the next 12 weeks, Chuck and I are going to be going over to accomplish that mission. The series is titled Our Mission. And let me go ahead real quick and go with you over these 12 objectives. I'm just going to read them to you. And eventually, though I'm almost done, I will be giving out a membership handbook to everyone. And you'll be able to see these and read more in depth about these. So what are these objectives? It starts with number one, the first objective, which is the one that I'm going to go over here today. Train Christ-centered worshipers. Objective two, foster growth of God-centered individuals and families. Objective three, serve local community and the world. Objective four, biblical preaching and teaching. Objective five, build flourishing and authentic relationships. Objective six, vibrant ministry groups, which is our Sunday school ministry here. Seven, promote intentional evangelism and outreach. Objective eight, work for ethnic and multi-generational diversity. Objective nine, practice edifying spiritual disciplines. 10, gospel-centered ministries. 11, cultivate sacrificial, gospel-centered giving of time, energy, resources, and finances. And then last, but certainly not least, is one that you may not have thought of, but something that I want to have a long discussion on, and that is meaningful church membership. These are the 12 objectives that we're going to be facilitating here at Cedar Heights to accomplish our mission of worship, discipleship, and service. And today, what I want to do, because we don't have much time, We've got a lot of stuff in a little time, so I want to skip some of the stuffing and go straight to the meat. What I want to talk about today is objective one, train Christ-centered worshipers. Now, what I want to talk about today is Christ-centered worship, and there are hundreds of passages that I could use to discuss this, but I've honed in here on Hebrews 13. So if you would please turn with me to Hebrews 13, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 16. 9 through 16 of Hebrews 13. The purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show the superiority of the new covenant of grace versus the old covenant of law. 
In other words, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but we know the purpose of Hebrews. And it's to show that the covenant of grace, that is the redemptive plan of the good news, is better than the old plan of the law. It's not that the law was necessarily bad, it's just that God's new covenant has usurped it. And what I want to talk about in our passage today is, is what does it mean to be Christ-centered worshipers? We can see that here in our passage, so if you would please stand with me in honor of reading God's word. I'm going to read verses 9 through 16. I'll say a prayer and then you guys can be seated. Verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which these are rather those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let's pray. Father, we believe wholeheartedly that you have placed Cedar Heights Baptist Church here. It is your church, your called out body, here for your purpose and your pleasure. I pray, Father, that by your grace, and we know that by your grace alone, you help us to accomplish the mission that you have given us, that we honor and glorify you and everything that we do. This morning, I pray that through your word, you speak to us and you show us what Christ-centered worshipers look like, so that we may be ever worshipful of you. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, here in our passage, especially in the first few passages that I'll talk about here in a minute, we don't know specifically about what is going on. In other words, we don't know exactly what the author is trying to address. We have some hints, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but we're not completely sure about what's going on. But what we are sure of is that the passage here, the author is trying to convey to us what worship looks like, specifically what Christ-centered worship looks like. Now, that may not be very evident on the surface of the passage here, but when we dig deep, I think we'll see that. And my goal here from our passage this morning, and I'm going to be sticking very close to our text, so don't close your Bible, don't close your app, keep it open, keep it ready, because we're going to be walking through these passages this morning to see what Christ-centered worship looks like and what it is. So let's jump right to it. The first thing about Christ-centered worship. Christ-centered worship is worship of a life that is set apart. Worship is a life that is set apart. Look with me again here in verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by food, which have not benefited those are those devoted to them. We don't do it much anymore. We don't have one. But I know growing up, it was extremely popular to have a china cabinet in your house. I don't have one. My mom did growing up. And what was in that china cabinet? It was the fine china, right? It was the china that you didn't get out unless you had special guests or as a special occasion. It wasn't just any guests either. I mean, we're talking the preacher got to come over to get that stuff out, right? It's the fine china. And you don't use it in, except in special occasions or when all the other dishes are dirty and you don't want to clean them. 
That's it, right? These are dishes that are set apart for a particular purpose. And in the same way here, I think what we're seeing in this passage is, is that worship is a life that re- mirrors and reflects Christ who was set apart. And thus worship, true worship, is going to be a life that is set apart. Let's try to walk through that here in the passage. Verse 9 and verse 10 with me. Go to 10 now. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. What is going on here in this passage? Why is the author talking about foods and talking about the gospel of grace? What is happening here? Again, we're not really sure the issue that the author is addressing here, but we can make a good assumption that he's probably discussing one of the first heresies of the church. A heresy is basically when you take a church teaching and you teach counter to that. According to the covenant of grace, one is saved by grace through faith. That's it. Alone. In other words, by the grace of God, God gives you the grace to have the faith, to believe in him, and you're saved. That's how it works. But with, there were these Judaizers that were going around, and this was the first heresy the church had to address. It's addressed in the book of Acts as well. You can see it. The, the apostles had to meet together and actually discuss, do individuals need to also follow the law as well as believe Jesus is the Messiah? And they said, no, Gentiles don't have to follow the law. See, because that's what Judaizers were preaching. They were saying, look, you not only have to believe that the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, but you also have to follow after the Jewish law, even if you are not an ethnic Jew. And the early church said, no, that's, that's wrong. The new covenant doesn't say that. It's different. It seems that the author here is addressing that issue. But look with me here in verse 11 now. For the body of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So what is going on here in this passage, and how does this show us that worship is a life set apart? The author is referring here to the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16, you can read about this. In modern day context, it's usually called Yom Kippur. This is a time in which the high priest, and think with me for just a moment, the desert wandering Hebrews and the tabernacle that they, that they built out in the desert. Once a year, as you know, the, the, the high priest would go into the area where the Ark of the Covenant was housed, a place known as the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go in there. If anybody else did, like Aaron's sons, they would die. As a matter of fact, we know that high priests, especially during the time of Christ, whenever they went into the Holy of Holies, they usually had a rope tied around them. So if they went in there unworthily and they died, you didn't have to go in there and try. You could just drag them out, right, with a rope. But the high priest would go in there and he would take the blood of bulls and goats that he had sacrificed. And he would sprinkle and pour this blood all over the top of the Ark of the Covenant known as the Mercy Seat. The Mercy Seat was the section on top of the Ark of the Covenant between two cherub where it was said that that was the throne of God, if you will. And they would take this blood and they would sprinkle it over the top of the mercy seats as a a sacrifice to Yahweh, the high priest would. And the animals that were killed, that he extracted the blood from, he would take their dead carcasses then outside of the city or outside of whatever they would consider to be the city. And the high priest would then burn the animal carcasses so that no flesh could be consumed of the animals. This was a very reverent and intimate and important time of worship for the Hebrews. But it was a picture of what it was that Christ would do for us in the future. You see, ultimately the sacrifice that was done on the Day of Atonement was just really a temporary solution to an eternal problem. 
It didn't take care of the sins of the people for all of eternity. That took a perfect sacrifice. That took the Lamb of God. That took God Himself to offer Himself on the altar of the cross and give His blood there. And look with me. I promise I'm working to something here to make my point that worship is a life set apart. Look with me in verse 12 and 13. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through, uh, sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. The crucifixion happened outside of the city limits of Jerusalem. There are generally like three or four places that we think Jesus was crucified. We don't know for sure, but three or four places that are possibly the the location. All of them were outside of the city limits of Jerusalem at this time. Jesus, our sacrifice, was taken outside of the city gates and sacrificed on the altar of the cross. His blood was shed, not some animal sacrifice, on the mercy seat, not some sort of temporary solution, but this was an eternal solution to our problem, forgiving our sins. See, what was going on on the Day of Atonement is a picture of what Christ would do. Now, why does this bring us to the whole point of worship is set a life set apart, Chad? What are you trying to say? It really comes out when you understand what it means here in verses 12 and 13 when the author says that we must meet Jesus outside the camp. Everybody with me? Everybody tracking with me? I know it's a lot of detail. It's like a fire hydrant right now, I know. But hang with me. This is good. This is important. Not because I made it up. It's here in the text. I'm just pulling it out of the text. Ready? The idea of outside the camp is the idea, the author is asking us to live a holy, consecrated, set-apart life from that of the world. In other words, the author is saying that we, ourselves, must live a life that isn't like the world, but a life that is consecrated outside the camp, holy like Christ. That's worship. And Chuck has said here for 30 plus years, as John noted a moment ago, that the ultimate worship service that has ever taken place in the history of the universe was on the cross of Golgotha. Hey, look, we just went to Passion in Atlanta, and there was a lot of lights and music and smoke and lasers and fancy-looking people on the stage with shiny teeth and stuff like that. And that was all pretty overwhelming, to be quite honest with you. 65,000 students worshiping and singing to Christ, that was pretty incredible. But it it pales in comparison, rather, to what happened on Calvary. When Christ offered himself, he went outside the city gates, set himself apart for us, and we, in worship of him, are called to do the exact same thing. Set ourselves apart. A life of worship is a life that isn't just a weekend activity. It isn't just sort of a Sunday morning thing. A life of worship is a mindset that encompasses our entire life. Christ lived a life of worship. And our lives are to mirror that life of Christ. He was set apart. He offered himself on the altar of the cross and we ourselves in order to worship must follow him outside of the world, outside of the world's ideologies. In other words, what we have to do in this transition to my next objective, mentally, physically, what that, or mentally or even more than physically, what that means is that we must sacrifice our goals, our ambitions, our wants, our will, our desires to that of Christ. That's what worship is. Let's talk more about that here in the next part. The second thing that we can see about worship, Christ-centered worship, is this. Worship is sacrifice. Look back with me here in verse 10 for just a second. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. The altar that's being discussed here is the altar of the cross of the cross. It is Christ offering himself on the altar for us. It is sacrifice. That's what he's doing. 
And if we're going to mirror Christ, then we ourselves must live a life of sacrifice. Look at verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. We got we to parse this out here. Everybody listen to me. Verse 15. We got to get this. If you don't get this, you're going to miss number two. So if you've already checked out, check back with me. I can't give you a lot of fluff this morning. I don't have time. I got to go straight for the good stuff. Listen to me. Through him, note those words, through him. In other words, worship, and I've said this before, but it bears repeating over and over again, because it is a big deal in the evangelical world. It's a major deal in the evangelical world. You might not think much about it, but I'm constantly bombarded by this stuff. Worship is not about you. It's not about what you want. It's not about what emotionally connects to you. Worship is about Christ. And here it says through Him. In other words, what the author is getting out is our worship is done because of and for Christ. That's what's it. Through Him, we're going to offer the sacrifice of praise. It's Christ that we're worshiping. And it's because of Christ that we can worship. Everybody tracking with me here? Worship is not about us. It's about Christ. It's about surrendering our hearts. Notice what he says next. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. We got to get out of the mindset. Listen to me because this is going to be a shocker to some. We got to get out of the mindset that singing is worship. Listen to me. My voice just cracked. I don't know what's going on, but nonetheless, listen to me. Worship is an internal activity that has external implications. In other words, worship, true worship, happens here and here. And it may flow out of here. You may see it when I'm singing. But worship isn't singing. Worship is sacrificing and offering my life to Christ. And when I see how beautiful He is, when I see how glorious He is, when I see that He satisfies all of my desires, then I can't help but sing to Him. Or dance to Him, or read poetry, or read scripture, or pray, or whatever it is that you may express in worship. We call this a worship service. And that's fair enough. I mean, I do all the time. But in all reality, our entire lives are supposed to be a worship service. It is continual. It just doesn't happen on a Sunday morning activity. Notice what the author says. Let us continually offer up. It is an action that is constantly happening within our hearts and within our minds. And you may think something like this, Chad. Look, how am I worshiping God when I'm taking out the trash at the house? Chad, how am I worshiping God when I'm sitting at my computer... And I'm typing in a bunch of numbers. Chad, how am I worshiping God when I'm driving down the road? Look, worship is a continual act if it's done correctly. That is done internally and not seen as a mere external expression. Is everybody tracking with me here? See, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, in the evangelical world that think all they have to do is go to a service and there's nothing wrong with raising your hands. There's nothing wrong with getting on your knees. As a matter of fact, if you want to do it, I encourage you to do it here. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But there's a lot of people that think, worship, my arm's up. There it is. Worship, my arms are up. Kind of. This is the cool pastor worship. <laughs> worship. Now, no, see, worship happens here and here. And when we truly understand who Christ is, listen to me, when we truly are willing to sacrifice to Christ, then it comes out, man. I can't stop but singing how wonderful he is. I can't help myself but pray. Look, I've only danced spiritually one time in my life. One time in my life. And it was in front of nobody. It was just me and God. And I'm sure it looked completely stupid to anybody that's looking at me, right? Amen. If they happen to see, hey, hey, easy now. Anybody that's looking at me, right? But I remember being in my, my home, and I was alone, and I was reading a passage, and something just, something just came over where I realized something at that moment of how beautiful and glorious Christ was, and I just thought, 
Dude, I can't hold that. I gotta dance. I know it's weird. I felt weird. But I meant it. It's an expression of what's going on here. That's worship. That's sacrifice. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. Notice what's going on here. Since Christ has stopped all of the necessary, I guess I would just even say not only animal sacrifices, but Christ has been the ultimate sacrifice for us by offering his life on the altar of the cross. We now, in sacrificing to him, can do so in certain external ways, like praises, like prayer, and like another one that I'll talk about in a moment. Notice what the author is doing. The author is saying now that our sacrifice can be what we sing and what we say, what we declare. That's our expression of sacrifice. We don't have to offer, offer animals anymore. Thank the Lord. I'm glad I don't have to do that as a minister of Christ. Because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He did it for all. So now all I do is tell people, you see the cross? Go underneath there and allow that blood to cover you. And then you will see what worship's all about. Then you will know freedom. So let us continually offer up through him a sacrifice of praise. Singing isn't just, or rather, worship isn't merely just singing. And notice what he keeps saying. The fruits of lips that acknowledge his name. The fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. That phrase, fruit of lips, it's a weird phrase, right? It's a phrase that we get from Hosea. Hosea 14.2. And in the context of Hosea, what that is meant, it is going back to what I just talked about a moment ago, it's a praise that comes out because someone has a repentant heart. It's really a confession that someone is giving because of a repentant heart. So in other words, what the author, is, uh, the author of the passage is saying is, is let us offer our hearts, our minds to Christ. And the way that we express that worship, the way we show that worship, is not by sacrificing animals, but by declaring how good God is. Because though I am unworthy, though I can never do it on my own, though I don't deserve it, Christ has sanctified my heart by his blood that was given on the altar of the cross, and now I can sing praises because of what he's done for me. That's worship. That's what happens when you truly worship. Now, let me note something here real quick before I go on to, I want to note something about what John talked about in Romans 12. Because I'm nervous that some of you are going to do this. So I want to combat this opposition right off the bat. I'm nervous some of you are going to come in here and say this. Well, Chad, you know, I just really don't connect emotionally to the songs that Jennifer is singing or the message that you or Chuck are giving or the prayers. So I'm really not going to do anything. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to sit there or stand there. I would encourage you not to do that. <laughs> Here's why. Here's my argument, okay? I'm going to give you an argument the way of analogy. If indeed I don't feel like telling Holly, the most important person in the world to me, that I love her, is it still good that I tell her I love her? Yes, most of the ladies are saying yes. No dudes are, but it is good, dudes, that we do that. In other words, even if I am not emotionally connected to Holly in some sort of intimate, romantic way, it's still good that I say, baby, I love you. She likes it. Hey, I like it when she's mad at me because I've been a jerk that she still comes up to me and says, look, you are the meanest, jerkiest husband ever, but I still love you. She may not emotionally feel like doing it, but she does it and it's meaningful to me. I think the same applies to us. You may not be emotionally connected to the music. You may not be emotionally connected to the worship. You may not be emotionally connected to the message, but you still should sing. You still should pray. Lift your voices. Look, in Scripture, Jesus said, if human beings don't worship me, 
Then I'll have the rocks cry out. Anybody ever seen a rock that's sad or happy? That would just be a voice box praising God, and if that's all you can do and muster up, then do it. Now, Romans 12 also backs up what Hebrews is saying here in Hebrews 13, 15. In Romans 12, as John wrote, we are encouraged to present our bodies as living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. Worship is a living sacrifice. Let me say it like this, then I'm moving on, and we got to get done. I know time, no time, no look at your watch, hang on. I promise my conclusion is the last point and I'll wrap it up quickly. Listen to me. To follow Christ, it is costly. Hey, hey, look. To follow Christ, it is costly. It will cost you. But it's not regrettable. Being a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, is costly. It's hard. It's not always fun but it's never regrettable. And then the third way we see of Christ-centered worship here is this. Look with me in verse 16. And you're going to see where I'm going with this right off the bat. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices. Same word, by the way. In verse 15, and here, these are the exact same Greek words that Paul uses in Romans 12, 1, with a living sacrifice. Sacrifice, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. My third point about worship is that service is worship. Look, it's human nature that we would much rather be served than to serve. And a lot of times, when we are serving in a kitchen cleaning dishes, in the gym sweeping floors, in a classroom full of rambunctious children, in a youth room with students that have minds of mush, we all feel like this is what is going on here. I just want to get to the worship service and worship. But according to the passage here, service is worship. In other words, let me play this out, application. When you're vacuuming the church floors in the name of Christ, you're worshiping. When you're cleaning dishes in the church or for a friend in the name of Christ, you're worshiping. When you're picking up trash in the name of Christ, you're worshiping. When you're changing dirty diapers, God bless you, and you're doing it for the sake of Christ, guess what you're doing? You're worshiping. Worship is service according to this passage. I know human nature is that man, I'd rather be served. I'd rather my wife get my food and bring it to me versus me have to go and get her food and bring it to her, right? That's the way that we work. But that's not worship. Worship is service. Being willing to surrender your life, set your life apart, and being willing to serve, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when you don't get a lot of accolades and praises, and I know you don't in many areas of this church, but you still do it. See, we always like to think of worship as just singing. And I think some of you in here feel like you can't worship as well as others. I told her I was going to do this so she wouldn't be embarrassed. But here's an honest truth. I think that there are some in here that say, well, I can't worship like Jennifer because I don't have a voice like she has. We all know Jennifer sings amazingly. And we like to think, I, I can't worship like her because I don't sound like her. You can worship just like her. You'll never sound like her, but you can worship like her. And worship just as meaningfully as she does. Because worship is setting your life apart. Worship is sacrifice. And worship is service. Close with this. It's not a popular statement anymore. But it used to be popular when I was younger in the evangelical world. People used to say this. You don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. I have never seen that in my life. I have never seen someone that's so heavenly minded 
that they are of no earthly good. I've seen a whole lot of people that are so earthly minded that they are of no heavenly good, but never the opposite. I want us to be a people that are so heavenly minded, so focused on Christ and what it is that he did, that because of that, we have an impact on this world. You want to worship? Starts here. Let's pray. Holy Father, you have given us the ultimate picture of what worship actually is. And I pray that by your grace, as your word says in Hebrews 13, 15, through you, so it's because of you, it's for you, that you help us to worship you. Worship you rightly. May we be a people that are set apart, sacrificial, and servants. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand with us. And Chuck and I will be up here if you'd like to chat. And the altars are open as always. But sing with us here if you would.
going to read together our, our mission statement, but before we do that, I want to give you a quick assignment. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, something like that, Virginia Mills came up to me. Most of us know Virginia. Virginia loves painting. And Virginia came up and said, do you have anything in mind for me to paint? You been thinking about anything? I said, I do, as a matter of fact. I said, you know, Virginia, in Isaiah chapter 52, in introducing the Suffering Servant Song of 53, it says Christ would be successful, he would do, deal prudently. And then it goes on to say that his visage was so marred beyond that of any man, which basically means this Suffering Servant would be so marred in his face you couldn't even recognize him as a human. And then it goes on to 53, the suffering servant song, the high watermark of the Old Testament poetry. I said, I would love to see a picture sometime painted of Christ on the cross. The, the, the position would kind of be above him, looking down at him with his head, so you couldn't see his face because it's so marred, you couldn't recognize him. And then on the cross, I would like to see his hands lifted, raised, because the cross is the consummate act of worship, as Chad's been preaching here this morning. It is the greatest worship service, the sacrifice on the cross. Amazingly enough, three days later, she came with this portrait, unveiled it for me. I was blown away. And it hangs on a wall right here in our church. We used to have a little plaque at the bottom of it, and I don't know where it's gone, but it just said one word, worship. So sometime when you have time, just walk out. When you leave the auditorium, turn to your right. And on that wall on your right, you'll see this picture of worship. I think it's the greatest portrait ever made of the cross with the hands uplifted in worship. Okay, our mission statement. You join with me. We'll start at the top with our mission. Ready? Our mission. We seek to honor and glorify God through worship, discipleship, and service.